for my benefit as well as everyone else's, if uh, you want to uh, just give me your first name and, and then that will help us with the conversation. Okay. Yep, I'm going to take it. Oh. Is it being talked about the moon? And you didn't mention it at all? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you and I can talk about it later rather than get too distracted by that, but uh, very little link between those two things. Because I remember seeing the, the graph of energy released after the earthquakes and it followed the sine curve and it was quite similar to the patterns of the moon. Sure. Um, so the, the, got from the there, there's been compelling scientific evidence to suggest there's no link. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, this one was occurred in 1717. Do you know where that was? Um, we know broadly the area that it was because um, we've performed geological investigations at different points along the fault. Uh, but we don't definitively know where it started and where it finished and even where it initiated. Um, so obviously 300 years ago we have relatively vague uh, description of the exact details. But we do know broadly speaking that it was a, a larger I'm Hamish. Um, I'm told that in Japan they have an earthquake warning system which measures the electromagnetic changes in the earth uh, just, prior, just prior to a, um, uh, breaking the crust. Um, is that something that might be coming here? What's the, what's the situation with that? Useful? Yep, sure. So um, the earthquake warning system itself doesn't detect anything electromagnetic. What it actually detects is the fact that when we have an earthquake, we have P waves and S waves. Because the P waves travel a lot faster, at, for example, in Haast, we've already realized the earthquake started. We send a message through telecommunications at the speed of light to Christchurch to say the ground shaking's on the way. Okay? So an early warning system doesn't predict an earthquake's going to occur. It's telling you the earthquake is occurring. You just haven't felt it. Okay. So the other important aspect there is that the, the benefit of an early warning system depends on how far away you are from the earthquake. If we had an early warning system for the case of the 22nd of February 2011 earthquake, by the time you got the message, you already you know what's going on. <laughs> so it would only be useful for someone on the west coast and by the time they realised they weren't too worried. So the, one, one, sorry, uh, one thing just to mention there quickly is uh, those warning systems do exist in a few countries, uh, Japan, Mexico, and they're trialing one in the United States at the moment. They're extremely expensive, and as I just alluded to, they don't work in all particular cases. Um, where they are most useful is for automatically shutting down critical facilities, trains, the surgeon working on someone at the time. They're not actually very useful for us. Okay, if I told you you had 10 seconds now, it wouldn't actually help us any more than if we just started to feel it. Sue here. One of the experiences we had was that the vertical thrust caused much more damage, fear, disturbance and everything than the horizontal shakes. Has your work differentiated at all between the vertical and horizontal impacts and spread from quakes? Yep, yeah, thanks. Um, so the important thing to understand there is the sensitivity to vertical shaking very much depends on the particular structure um, and it also depends on the type of soil that you're on and most importantly how close you are to the earthquake. So the vertical shaking is much higher in frequency, meaning that it goes up and down much more faster than the horizontal shaking goes side to side. And because of that, the amplitude of that vertical shaking, or how strong it is, reduces much more quick, quickly as we move away from the earthquake. So when we have, for example, the magnitude 6.2 earthquake, the vertical <coughs> shaking, broadly speaking, was strong within about four or five kilometers from the earthquake, but actually out at Christchurch Airport, for example, the shaking is very weak. Okay, so it really depends on where you are. Um, and also, because of the difference in shaking, it's much more higher frequency, that can be more detrimental or more beneficial for some type of structures. But the calculations that we're doing do model both horizontal and vertical shaking. Thanks. With the information you've got, Brendan, you can tell us whether to expect liquefaction in Christchurch during this outright fault event? Yes, um, roughly speaking we can. The, the main difficulty is what I alluded to before, that 
the amplitude of the shaking would be lower than it was for the February earthquake, but the duration is significantly longer. Okay, and many of you will know from just first-hand experience that you can have a decent shake, but if it lasts so short, there's no evidence of liquefaction. Whereas an earthquake which produces the same shaking but lasts a little bit longer tends to be more likely to cause liquefaction. Okay, and that's because liquefaction is a cumulative phenomenon. The easiest analogy is if you take a paper clip and you bend it backwards and forward. Okay, paper clips are particularly ductile. You can bend it right round, but do that six or seven times and eventually breaks. Okay, same phenomena associated with liquefaction. You need the ground to move backwards and forwards enough times to generate that pressure in the water. So, broadly speaking, we can. The difficulty is that we haven't observed how sensitive soils are to 200 seconds of shaking, even if that shaking is relatively low amplitude. So, there are some difficulties in us being able to do that. Thank you. It seems, based on your animation, that Christchurch City could get between 90 and 100 seconds warning of that. Earthquake. Yep. It seems pretty feasible to me as a complete amateur that we could get a good warning of that. Yeah, and um, even without a complicated warning system, we probably will because using social media, uh, there will be people in Queenstown that are sending messages. You know that we've seen that that the, the earthquake, uh, sorry, the internet is much more reliable than some uh, phone calls and, and those sorts of things. So we probably will get an impromptu one, but. Um, I, I don't expect at this stage that we will install that early. Hi, I'm Kristen. Um, with being able to produce the simulation within a very short period after an earthquake, does it give you any insight into aftershocks that are likely to occur? Um, not directly. It, it tells us really the regions where the ground is moving the most at the ground surface. Um, so it's most useful for us to be able to understand where we expect to see more damage to housing, where we might expect to see areas which have more chance of liquefaction. It doesn't tell us um, the likelihood of another earthquake right beside it. Um, but we do have other models that are able to do that. Uh, Professor Brandon, I'm Usama. Uh, I have a question about how confident you use the 7.9 Alpine fault because it's flat one, we should have magnitude 9. Experience in Indonesia and Japan. Yeah, so the, the key aspect is to get something a certain magnitude, you need enough of a fault to break. Okay? So if those central and southern sections of the fault, that length of the fault 410 kilometers long, that can't produce a magnitude 9. The only way that we would be able to get a larger magnitude earthquake is if that fault didn't stop at Arthur's Pass, it kept going further. It went up to Springs, uh, sorry, up to uh, St. Arnold or even all the way to Blenheim. Okay, it's definitely possible. It's less likely, uh, but it is possible. The other thing to keep in mind is that the magnitude scale is logarithmic. Okay, so if I make the length from 410 kilometers to 500 kilometers, it'll go from 7.9 to maybe 8.0 or 8.1. Okay, in order to get to nine. It has to be about 600 kilometers long and about 200 kilometers deep. Okay, so the magnitude scale is logarithmic. You really need something quite different. Although to to uh, to deviate from our South Island focus so far, there is the potential for such large magnitude earthquakes off the east coast of the North Island, okay, where the, we have a subduction zone in exactly the same way uh, that Japan has a subduction zone off its east coast. So it is possible for us to have earthquakes that get up in the medium to high magnitude eights. Um, so that's why the South Island's not necessarily so bad. <laughs> Hi, Elodie here. Um, I have a question regarding the ground velocity. Of course your model is based on a, on a mapping done for ground velocity. Is there any study, ongoing study to develop uh, the knowledge uh, of the different ground across the South Island? Uh, yeah, so um, at the moment our research is really focused on the impacts on the Canterbury area and the reason for doing that is simply that we have a very strong uh, trust in the model. We've been able to compare our model with lots of observations and therefore we're producing results which we know have uh, a very chance of being quite accurate with what we would expect. We do have immediate plans to extend the region uh, and incorporate some of the other sedimentary basins. There are important 
basins in the, uh, the Volva region, the Wairau Basin and the Nelson uh, Tasman area, also the Southland area, uh, the Mackenzie Basin where a lot of the hydroelectric uh, infrastructure is located. So we are improving those models continuously to try and improve the corrections. Thank you. I'm Hugh. Um, the simulation had the earthquake starting now around about Haast. Yeah. If it had started around about um, uh, Greymouth, what would be the difference in the field effects? Yeah, good question. question. So the question, just to, to repeat it uh, with the use of a, a picture, is that um, we were talking about the earthquake starting here and moving to the north. What happens if it started at the north and moved to the south? Okay. In that case, the actual the, the nature of the shaking would be quite different. We would no longer get all of that wave energy sort of moving towards Canterbury, but instead most of it moving away from Canterbury. You would still get some of the same phenomena happening in terms of uh, waves getting trapped in the soft soils, but the nature of that trapping would be quite different. So one of the important things with a large earthquake like this is the position where the earthquake starts actually has quite a strong influence. So these are calculations that we haven't done yet, but we are uh, progressively doing to try and understand this. So is that a worst case? Probably for the Canterbury region, this is definitely going to produce longer and stronger shaking uh, than an earthquake which propagates the other direction. Thank you. Hello, uh, Kevin here. I'm just wondering the um, trenches that have been dug on, on the fault, is that going to help your modelling or simulation? Um, yes and no. Um, really, and, and not a lot because that those trenches are usually only on the order of about five, maybe six or seven metres deep. Um, whereas we're trying to understand how the waves propagate in the top tens of kilometres. Uh, so those trenches are mainly useful to try and look at the different soil layers and see have they been offset by an earthquake in the past. So those approaches are really trying to understand the last earthquake rather than what necessarily may happen in the future. Thanks. Uh, Blair, the, <coughs> the prevalence of um, online access to information about how many earthquakes are happening and how big they are around the world has all sort of brought a, a lot of attention to us here in, in Christchurch as we see that in terms of some of the modelling we've seen and some of it's very innovative. How does that inform us seeing the increased knowledge of earthquakes in terms of things like the computational power to sort of work out how big these things could be and other places like Portland, Oregon, and, and um, Vancouver, and those sorts of places where you've got a massive potential for subduction zone uh, deformation. Yep, great. There were a lot of questions in that commentary, but I'll try and pick out a few of them. Um, so the first one is definitely with, with the prevalence of, of media, we now understand more about earthquakes. You'll also notice if you're an astute follower of media that it goes in cycles. When we've happened to have an earthquake recently in New Zealand, we start hearing a lot about ones that are happening overseas. People start asking questions, is there a link between the two? There's not, it's just that we're not hearing about the ones overseas when we're not having ones recently in New Zealand. Um, ultimately, better understanding small earthquakes helps us improve our ability to predict the consequences of larger earthquakes. Um, but there is a limit. Once we get small enough in size, the, the size of the earthquake, we can no longer feel it. Some of the instruments that are most useful don't actually distinguish between the shaking from the earthquake and just the background noise uh, from wind and, and ocean waves and, and so on. Um, so there is a, a lower threshold in that regard. What we do know though, even though we can't predict where the next earthquake is going to be, we do know that roughly for every magnitude 5, there's 10 magnitude 4s. For every six, there's ten fives. For every seven, there's ten sixes, and so on. Okay? So, all part, we know the relative ratio between small magnitudes and large magnitudes. It's easy to remember, it's about a factor of ten as you go between each magnitude unit. And therefore, large magnitude earthquakes are inevitable um, as a result of the fact that over time we're going to have enough of, of a small one. Okay, a couple more questions, and then I'm sure people are ready to go. We'll take three more. So if you could wave your magic wand and move Christchurch to the safest place in the South Island, <laughs> <laughs> where would that be? Yeah, good question. Very good, because I should make a comment like that even if you didn't ask it. The most important thing is that I mentioned on the first uh, slide that I had that understanding the impacts of earthquakes depends on both the strength of the ground shaking and secondly the vulnerability of the natural and the built environment. 
Okay, so we can't change if an earthquake occurs, we can't change what the shaking will be, we can better understand what the shaking will be, that's what this talk was all about, we can change our vulnerability. So I would argue, and I think many of you would agree, that actually Christchurch now is the safest place in the South Island, <laughs> because we don't have our most vulnerable buildings anymore. <laughs> so the, the idea is that you know at least we're learning lessons from from the earthquakes that we've had, okay, and and that's what we should be doing as a society is taking the lessons from Christchurch and applying them everywhere else. There is the recently um, discussed earthquake prone building legislation in front of Parliament, um, but we're yet to see some of the implications of that. We know that. The timeline around where people have to improve their buildings have been extended 20, 30 years. Uh, so that some of the buildings that we know are relatively at earthquake risk may not be actually fixed before the time of the next major earthquake in a particular region where they are. So I think it's really important for us to consciously advocate, you know, to understand that we are occupiers of these buildings, whether we're the owner of the building or not, and make sure that we apply the pressure both to building owners but also to the government broadly that earthquakes are an issue. Uh, the Canterbury earthquakes are one example of highlighting that, and we need to, to try and make sure that we're more resilient as a society. Are you looking at extending your models and simulation so that they look at the ability of subduction zone earthquakes to generate tsunami and actually model tsunami generated from subduction zone yep. earthquakes such as around Hakurangi, yep. Kermadeep and Tonga? Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, they are slightly different fields of research. Uh, it's not something that I'm personally involved with, but there are several researchers in New Zealand looking at uh, that problem, so yes. Okay, last question. Um, my name's Joe. I've just got one question. The artist passed earthquake in 29 in Murchison and then in Angahua. What's the correlation between that and the Alpine faults? Yeah, so obviously that didn't trigger an Alpine fault event at the time. Um, but the clustering, as we'd say, the occurrence of those earthquakes in a relatively short space of time is very analogous in some way to the sequence that we've had here in Christchurch where we had those four earthquakes that I talked about in the space of uh, just over a year. So we do see clustering of earthquakes in space and time. They can lead to slight increases in the likelihood of a future earthquake. They can also lead to slight decreases. Um, so overall, they probably haven't had any significant bearing on the Alpine Fault. The fact that they occurred about 80 years ago now is a good indication of that. OK, thanks very much again, everyone. <laughs>